So now that we've had a chance to talk about Spring Web MVC and Web Flux, let's take some time to talk about the similarities and differences between these two platforms. So there are obviously similarities and differences. Uh, some of the differences, some of the similarities, pretty obvious. They they both use annotations that we all know and love, like at controller and uh, at auto wired and at rest controller and all the other good things we've seen. Uh, the main difference, as we'll see here in a second, is that Spring Web MVC is synchronous, whereas Spring Web Flux is asynchronous. So what does that mean? Uh, what that means when we say that Web MVC is synchronous, it means it's built on the servlet API and it uses synchronous IO with one request per thread or one thread per request model. So out of, by default, that's the way it works. In contrast, Web Flux is asynchronous and therefore it's better equipped to leverage multiple cores with a smaller number of threads and handle a large number of connections. Now, if you really see what's happening under the hood, you'll see that there is essentially a, an event loop or event loops that are running serviced by different cores. And when you do operations using the Project Reactor APIs for fluxes and monos, under the hood, they're basically manipulating the information you pass and passing it off to threads that are running out of a pool of threads and then callbacks are happening. But the cool part is that the callbacks that we're talking about here are all transparent to the server code that uses the mono and flux reactive types. You, you don't actually see those callbacks, unlike other asynchronous environments that you may be familiar with where you, you do actually have to have callbacks directly and that's kind of ugly and nasty. So that's one of the nice things about the spring web flux model is that that complexity is kind of shielded. You are shielded from that type of complexity. But here's really what I wanted to talk about. And this is pretty cool. So uh, in a previous class, we had had a discussion about what is the consequence of using mono and flux types as endpoints in order to be able to exchange HTTP requests and responses? What does that really mean? Does that mean that you suddenly have to take all the tools that you've worked with before that work with traditional web get and post requests and throw them out the window? Does it mean you have to write all your clients only with reactive types and throw all the other stuff out the window? Well, the answer it turns out is no, you don't. So here's what I wanna show you. And we'll, we'll take a look at this from a couple different points of view. First, I'll show you just the, the text in the slide and then we'll run into some examples and see how this works. So if you take a look at this, you can see that you can use either web client, which is the async reactive way of doing the programming, or you can use REST template, and you can use these to send and receive HTTP requests and responses to and from reactive endpoints. So if you define your types, if you define your controllers with reactive types, you can access them one of two ways, or, or both ways for that matter. Um, and so as, as you'll see here when we get into this, if you do this, if you start doing this approach, it's probably a good idea to auto wire the fields just because then all the initialization is done properly for all the things you need to have work correctly for this to work transparently and seamlessly. So here's the cool part. If you have endpoints that are using reactive types, like what we've looked at before, but you want to use traditional synchronous programming to get access to them, there's nothing that stops you from doing that. So here's an example where we can access endpoints defined with mono and fluxes using a good old REST template, which is just a kind of classic Spring Web MVC like model that's entirely synchronous. And what it's doing is it treats the reactive types synchronously from the caller's perspective. However, the server side can still be reactive out the wazoo and the client can just ignore that reactivity if it, if it so deems necessary. And in fact, you can actually go one step further if you're really so inclined. And once you get back something that came back synchronously, then it's of course trivial to convert it back to a reactive type. So if you've got back an array of airport objects, then all you have to do is just say flux.fromiterable and then turn it into a list of airports or get back an empty list. So it's, it's easy to convert back if you need to. However, you're actually way better off, of course, just sticking with web client. If you want 
reactivity on the client side, on the caller side, just use web client. And that will inherently leverage reactive types more effectively since it allows the responses to be emitted as soon as they're available, rather than what we did with the uh, REST template where it had to wait for the thing to come back as an array before you could do anything with it. Now, some other interesting things here, this approach, it's not obvious to the naked eye, but this approach actually is in fact reactive. And what's confusing is if you look at this code, it's not really clear that the get URI retrieve body to flux isn't just running in the calling thread. But if you put a little bit of logging in your code, you'll realize that the network calls that are being made here to go over to the, to the server to get the results of the URI, that's all actually running off the calling thread. So uh, it'll basically run in a, in a thread from a pool of threads that's managed by, by web flux and, and project reactors internal mechanisms. And what's cool about this is it allows you to have end-to-end -end asynchrony through all the different parts of a pipeline from the client to the controller, to the service, if you have one, to the model portion, if you're working with asynchronous databases and so on. And so there's no need to block sort of ever. And the other thing that's interesting about this is the whole thing is very lazy because the HTTP request is actually not even sent until the client calls subscribe or some variant of subscribe like block or blocking get or block optional or whatever. So this allows everything to be very reactive to not clog up the calling thread. And yet the code looks pretty much identical to the code you'd write in a synchronous model, but it's actually running asynchronously from the point of view of all the different things that are happening in the system. Now, the other thing that's important, and this is really important to understand, the JSON encoding and decoding is identical for reactive web flux, mono and flux types, or the more traditional web MVC reference types like list and map and so on and other things. And so if you take a look at the actual code that comes back and forth in terms of the JSON, if you make a request, you get back identical JSON code. It's the implementation that processes the code that comes in that's different not the actual information that's sent back and forth between the client and the server. So as a consequence, these standard tools like Postman, as we'll see in a minute, can work seamlessly with either reactive types or with the more traditional Java collections, and nothing has to change in the way that you use those tools. So the good news is you can add this stuff as you see fit. You don't have to make any special changes. You can still use entirely synchronous ways to get access to entirely asynchronous microservices. But of course, you're probably better off by using the reactive stuff because it gives you more power and gives you the ability to stream things out as, they, as the results come back. So that's the end of the overview of Spring, WebMVC, and WebFlux.